afternoon and welcome to our TV show featuring documentaries revealing the realities behind myths using research and scholarship. I'm your host, Ergun Kurlukovalı, and I will be with you every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're welcome to send me your feedback at www.mythsandrealities.com. According to Professor Justin McCarthy's 2010 book, Turks in America, prejudice against Turks had already existed in Europe and America for centuries. Some dated back to conquest of Constantinople in 1453, which not only changed its name to Istanbul, but also marked the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the Renaissance and the Age of Discovery. Others go further back to the times of the Crusades between 1095 and 1291, when a series of religious wars initiated, supported, and sometimes directed by the Latin Church. The best known of these Crusades are those waged to liberate Jerusalem from Islamic rule. Still others go even before that to Seljuk Turks times. In all of these cases, Turks were a powerful presence in the tricontinental geography extended from Eastern and Southern Europe to Central Asia, from Southern Russia to Middle East and North Africa, from Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean. There were many religious wars and Turks carried the flag of Islam, which may explain why Turks were defamed in and demonized for centuries in the Christian West. By the time of World War I, however, anti-Turkish prejudice was cultivated and expanded by two cooperating agencies, the American Missionary Establishment and the Propaganda Office of Great Britain. During World War I, missionaries had undertaking, undertaken a massive effort to vilify Turks. This was far, partly an extension of a long tradition of rhetoric against Muslims. Another motive to the period of the World War. By the end of 19th century, the efforts of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions had evolved into a mission to the Armenians. Even though other Christian groups benefited from missionary schools, most students in the schools and nearly all of the converts to pro pro Protestantism were Armenians. With the coming of war between Ottomans and Russians, an intercommunal war between Armenians and Muslims, the missionaries saw the imminent destruction of their mission and they felt great sympathy for Armenian losses. They organized massive relief efforts to aid Armenian and Assyrian Christians. Propaganda against Turks was a tool to increase donations. The missionary establishment hoped for an Armenian-Russian triumph in the war. They therefore made use of their considerable influence in American society to sway popular and political will against the Turks. The missionaries were the willing helpers of the British propaganda effort. Missionary propaganda and British propaganda fed each other and dependent, depended on each other. British wartime propaganda was in the hands of the Foreign Office. A war propaganda bureau was established by the Foreign Office in 1914 at Wellington House with C.F. Masterman as its director. British propaganda came to be known as Wellington House, which recruited some of the best minds in, in the British government and academia, including the historian Arnold Toynbee. By 1917, Wellington House had a staff of 54 and could call on 
help from other departments and ministries. The first report, published in June 1915, of Wellington House listed distribution of approximately 2.5 million copies of books, pamphlets, and other written propaganda in 17 languages. The second report, published February 1916, listed 7 million copies circulated. The United States was the most important focus of British propaganda. America was important as a supplier of goods, a moral force, and a potential ally against Germany. In propagandizing the United States, the British benefited from a common language and long-standing American sympathy for Britain. Careful lists were kept of pro-ally newspapers that could be relied upon to print appropriate materials. However, even those newspapers such as the Hearst Chain, which were not friendly to the British, were ultimately forced to base their stories on British materials because the British had destroyed German transatlantic cables and British cables were the only way to get news to America. This meant it passed through British censors. From the beginning, the British propaganda enterprise was completely secret, known neither to the British nor the foreign public. Propaganda materials were secretly funneled through individuals and organizations in the United Kingdom and Friends of Britain in the United States. Sir Gilbert Parker, a Canadian by birth and a member of British Parliament, was in charge of the campaign. His appointment and that of his successor, Geoffrey Butler, were never made public. The materials he distributed were always sent as if he were a private citizen engaged in personal distribution of information. He had 170,000 addresses on his list of Americans by 1917. Parker also supplied 555 American newspapers with Wellington House propaganda. The American government knew of this position, but Woodrow Wilson's government seemed pleased with it. Parker himself summarized the effects of his efforts. I quote, in fact, we have an organization extraordinarily widespread in the United States, but which does not know it is an organization. It is worked entirely by personal association and inspired by voluntary effort, which has grown more enthusiastic and pronounced with the passage of time. Finally, it should be noticed that no attack has been made upon us in any quarter of the United States, and that in the eyes of the American people, the quiet and subterranean nature of our work has the appearance of a purely private patriotism and enterprise." Unquote. Foreign Office documents record lists of propaganda material sent to the United States and distributed broadly. A British Distribution list from July 1916 indicated that their propaganda reached throughout the opinion makers of American society. Senators and representatives, newspapers, college presidents, historical societies, law schools, and others, all were on the list. Most of those on the list received copies of all the propaganda material, and some asked for and received additional copies for distribution. Wellington House was successful in turning respected American organizations into its agents. The Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, for example, was cited by Parker as of particular help in distributing British propaganda materials. While the primary focus of British propaganda was naturally the Germans, the British devoted much energy to vilifying the Turks, particularly in America. 
This was a part of the propaganda activity directed against all Britain's enemies in the war, but there were specific reasons for targeting the Turks. The British had agreed with their allies, France and Russia, that the Middle East was to be divided among them after the war. Convincing the world that Ottoman rule had been a disaster and that the Turks were murderous tyrants would make European colonial rule more pleasant. There was also the question of Russian persecution of the Jews, which was well publicized in America. The British feared that the actions of the Russian allies would jeopardize friendly relations between the allies and America. They could not do anything about Russia's anti-Semitism. Instead, they planned to create an even greater monster to take the Russians' place in the news. The Ottomans were to be that monster. The British Prime Minister, Lloyd George, personally and specifically ordered the propaganda office to deal with the Turks. He directed that Wellington House should stress the futility and immorality of the Turk, and above all, his massacres of all the industrious population. The Prime Minister directed that the propaganda be completely secret. John Buchan, the head of the Department of Information, took the job of anti-Turkish propaganda based on these focal points. A, the ancient riches and the great prosperity of Asia Minor and Mesopotamia. B, the damaging influence of the Turk on social and commercial progress. C, the incapacity of the Turk for absorbing conquered peoples or for administering equitably subject races. D, the impossibility of reforming the Turkish state. E, the danger of allowing an incompetent state to control the avenue between Europe and Asia. F, the religious element might also be pressed here. Most specifics of the British campaign against the Turks are impossible to obtain because the British destroyed almost all of the records of their propaganda office immediately after the war. What original documents remain are a small amount of material forwarded through the Foreign Office and retained in Foreign Office records, as well as some documents retained through bureaucratic confusion. Viscount Bryce was an inspired choice to author propaganda aimed at Americans. He had served as a popular British ambassador in Washington and had many friends in American political circles, among them President Woodrow Wilson. His history of the United States, the American Commonwealth, first published in 1888, had been well received by academics and the public. He had, moreover, a reputation as an honorable man and a friend of America. Bryce's views on the Turks were racist, defamatory, and malicious. Turkish government has been the worst, very worst, which has afflicted humanity during the last 15 centuries. The Turks have always been what a distinguished European historian of the last generation called them, nothing better than a band of robbers encamped in territories which they had conquered and devastated. They have never become civilized." Unquote. Given his views, it would not have been odd for Viscount Bryce to produce a volume such as The Treatment of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, which was admittedly his personal work. In the introductory material of the volume, he wrote that it was a personal enterprise. Quote, I wrote to all persons I could think of 
likely to possess or to be able to procure trustworthy data, begging them to procure trustworthy data, I had the good fortune to secure the cooperation of a young historian of high academic distinction, Mr. Arnold J. Toynbee. He undertook to examine and put together the pieces of evidence collected, arranging them in order." Unquote. This was pure fabrication. Toynbee, working for and, as, for and assisted by the Propaganda Bureau, was the actual author and Bryce the figurehead. The book is in no sense a private undertaking. It was in fact a piece of British government propaganda. The book on Armenian atrocities was a companion volume to the first Bryce atrocity report, also edited by Toynbee. That first report was on the German atrocities in Belgium and has been thoroughly discredited by historians. All the techniques seen in the Armenian report had been refined in the earlier report on alleged German atrocities in Belgium. Anonymous reports collected from unimpeachable sources, but no physical record of what the sources really said or wrote. In his analysis of wartime propaganda, H.C. Peterson described the Bryce report on the Germans, I quote, his report is one of the most extreme examples of assassination by word. It was in itself one of the worst atrocities of the war." Unquote. Interestingly, the same sorts of crimes appear with regularity in Bryce's report of Ottoman Armenians. The two Bryce reports, along with additional books by Toynbee and others, were part of a well-constructed British propaganda effort. They were successful attempts at painting Britain's enemies black and thus affecting the outcome of the war. In the case of the Germans, they were instrumental in bringing the United States into the war against the Hun. In, in the case of the Turks, they were instrumental in creating a lasting stereotype of Turks as vicious killers. While the British propaganda against the Germans has been thoroughly studied and labeled for what it was, wartime propaganda with little veracity, the propaganda against the Turks has never been put to the same scrutiny. Had the sources of the evidence been presented at the time of the publication, the Bryce report would have been seen as propaganda, not as evidence of the neutrals. The main sources of atrocity stories were, in fact, American missionaries and Armenians. 59 of the 150 accounts in Bryce's book were written by missionaries. 52 were written by individual Armenians who were copied from an Armenian newspaper. Readers of the Bryce report had no way to know how closely many of the sources were tied the, uh, the Armenian cause. Writing of the Armenian patriarch, for instance, were described only as the work of an authoritative source. Most incredibly, no less than seven of these 150 documents had been forwarded by the Dashnak party. The Dashnak had organized revolutions against the Ottoman government for decades and were the main party of revolutionaries fighting against the Ottoman in Eastern Anatolia at the time. The Dashnak source was never identified. Other documents were taken from articles in Armenian newspapers controlled by Dashnak sympathizers. A number of other documents were forwarded by Armenian political representatives such as Bogos Nubar, representative of an Armenian independence organization. The level of authentication in the Bryce report was outrageous. 
According to the secret document, most of the non-missionary informants were known to the British only as Armenians. The British had no other information on their bona fides or veracity. 14, nearly 10% of the narratives had no known authors. The British had no idea who the authors were, but included the stories anyway. Still other reports were admitted into secret document to be based on reports from unknown persons, not on the knowledge of the supposed author, because almost all of the other names were hidden as well. All these unknowns appeared in the Bryce report as if their identities were known but disguised. That was a lie. The treatment of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire was a total propaganda victory for the British. There was no one to represent the Ottoman case, and the Bryce report was taken as corroboration of the message that Americans were already receiving from the missionary establishment. Indeed, the use of the Bryce report in America created an interesting relationship. The report itself was largely drawn from missionary and Armenian narratives, though it seldom identified the missionary in Armenian source, sources as such. The missionary establishment was also publishing reports from Armenians and missionaries. The, to convince American readers of the veracity of their reports, missionary organizations referred readers to the British reports. Missionary works on the Turks and Armenians often used phrases such as, now our old friend Ambassador Bryce has proven our contentions. It appeared that they had found independent verification of their claims. In fact, the Bryce report was based on and perhaps exaggerated those same missionary and Armenian reports the American missionary establishment was given advanced page proofs of the Bryce report on the Armenians so that it could be used in their own propaganda. The British also distributed parts of the report in advance of publication to American newspapers. Gilbert Parker reported the New York Times, Philadelphia Public Ledger, and the Chicago Herald devoted much space to the advanced sheets of these Armenian horror stories. They did indeed devote much space. Current History, a monthly magazine feature of the New York Times, made the Bryce Report the centerpiece of a series of anti-Turkish articles quoting the entire lengthy introduction of the Bryce Report and summarizing the most ghastly portions of the book. The New York Times itself devoted three pages to extracts from the Bryce Report. The New Republic praised Bryce on his election, on his selection of sources and evidence without mentioning that most of the sources were anonymous then went on to summarize the material and condemn the Turks. Other papers and magazines did the same, summarizing or quoting directly from the report. One can see the connections between deep-seated Orientalism and the persistent construction of the stereotype. Politically motivated texts produced during the First World War as war propaganda, portrayed Turks as enemy of civilization. This at a time when Britain and later the United States were at war with the Ottoman Empire, unofficially known as Turkey in the West. After the First World War, racist characterizations of Turks in these racist texts made them tactless and they were soon forgotten. In recent decades, however, 
the Armenian diaspora and some international actors which has, have issues with Turkey have been recycling these bigoted tests in concerted effort to destabilize the Republic of Turkey and to otherize Turks as genocidal. Where do we go from here? Will the Armenian diaspora realize that their mass deception is no longer working? Will Armenia perhaps open its archives to all historians and researchers like Turkey did 40 years ago? Will Turkish Americans achieve the civilized dialogue with the Armenian diaspora? Those are all great questions to explore in future episodes. Thank you for joining me and see you next week.